Okay, good morning to Tronfuse, Point City, uh, Mr. Club, and fellow rangers and interns. Uh, this is my final presentation on my project Nocturnal Wildlife at uh, ICSC. So I'll be describing their behaviors and habitats And uh, hopefully I'll be finishing my bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy by August. This August. So a little introduction. Uh, wildlife traditionally refers to undomesticated animal species including all organisms that grow or live in the wild uh, without being introduced by animals. So any intro introduced species, like invasive species, is actually not considered wildlife. Um, nocturnal is defined as done, occurring, or active at night. And nocturnality is an animal behavior characterized by being active at night and sleeping during the day, which is opposite to humans. Uh, diurnal is the opposite of nocturnal, which means active during the day and sleeping at night. Uh, habitats is the natural environment of an animal, plant, or other organisms. In this case, ICSC is located in one of the most, if not the most, diverse tropical dipterocarp forest in Southeast Asia. So, in another sense, we can consider ICSC as a disturbance in this natural habitat. And animal, the study of animal behavior is called ecology. So, um, it usually focuses on animal observations under natural conditions. So, whatever I've been doing here is considered ecology. Uh, conservation behavior is a growing field whereby animal behavior research is applied to conservation management. So when making conservation plans and methods, we, in, we include the, how animals react to the conservation plans. Up. So this is my project overview. I've done mapping, uh, description of behaviors and habitats. And then my, one of my goals is to understand animal behavior in terms of conservation. And I also find out the best times for nocturnal encounters. Uh, for example, if tourists want to go out at night, I can su suggest a good time not to go out. So, what causes nocturnal animal behavior? First of all, it's genetics because it what's it's what makes us humans and what makes a butterfly fly. Uh, the environment can affect morphological and physiological development. In turn, behavior develops as a result of that animal's shape and internal working. For example, why does a bird do courtship rituals and do thus dances? And why do they feed at certain times? So why do we eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner when we So circadian rhythm, it basically means uh, internal biological clocks. And it's one of the most universal traits shared among all living, uh, living organisms. Uh, except for Sariga, he doesn't know when he's day or night. <laughs> and according to a lecturer and researcher at University of Illinois, this biological clock is located in the hypothalamus of the brain. So it controls basic functions like breathing, uh, our heart rate, or our reproduction. And light is sensed by the eyes, and this sensory input uh, is sent to the biological clock. This clock then communicates to the brain, indicating whether it's night or day. Uh, so yeah, this, this biological clock, it tells the, the animal to, you know, hey, it's time to migrate, or hey, it's time to hibernate and sleep, or hey, it's time to make babies. And <laughs> courtship rituals um, is controlled also by this rhythm, this circadian rhythm, and to ensure that the offsprings are born during a season where food is uh, plentiful and it increases their chance of survival. 
So animals need to know the night, the known night or day to fill their niche in nature. So what are the adaptations? The in the retinas, it we have broad cells that are DNA basically packed in a certain way, in a special way that collects light. So animals have even more special rod cells like that collect light better than humans. And not all animals depend on vision. Some have heightened sense of smell, like, um, yeah, just better sense of smell. And bats, they have echolocation, which is where they make certain frequencies that reflect back to them and they know where things are. And yeah, this photo is taken from Reddit. You can see the owl's eyeball through their eardrum because that's a certain adaptation because their eyeballs are really big and they can see really well at night due to this adaptation. So my hypothesis of this project is that light pollution is negatively affecting nocturnal animal behavior and presence in, in and around ICSC. So you can see this photo at Gossing is very bright and the lights are actually uh, it's bright light to humans but to animals it's even brighter because their eyes are extra sensitive. So how did I uh, what did I do and what did I use to prove my hypothesis? Um, so all these things, binoculars, camera Night walk, night drives, continuous sampling, camera traps, and misnapping. So, this ethogram is one thing that not many people know what it is. Uh, it's basically a table of uh, behaviors. Oh, actually, it's here. Yeah, it's a. This is an ethogram. Now. It's a table full of um, general behaviors of animals, uh, and then there's codes to use. Uh, which makes it easy when I'm doing observations and I just write the code of what they're doing within that certain time. So from when we spot the animal until they run away or we walk away, it's what I've been writing down. Like what, did, what are they doing, eating, foraging, walking, sleeping. And yeah, so this is, this is a general on the top. This is just general because uh, all of my observations include all mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects, etc. Oh, and birds. But yeah. And when do I go out to do these observations? Uh, it's usually after sun, between sunset and sunrise. So you can see that this time is when the gen set is off. And that period of time is when the gen set is on. So basically when all the lights are on. And then bird watching would be within this hour, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. So where is uh, all my observations? is on site within the campus and within all the trails. Now. And outside is to Tampoy Research Station or the Simpang Bulukuli. And yeah, so this is just a small screenshot of my observations or how I key in my data to my computer. Uh, it lists the date, time, name, scientific name, and how many, and then how did I see them. So DS is direct sighting, SC is uh, sound call. So if I hear any animals, I will confirm with the rangers uh, to know what I mean. And then this is the behaviors, resting, locomotion, uh, foraging. So if the animal is looking for food, it's foraging now. And then location and photo. And this is for birds. So the yellow cells uh, are what we call in the mist nets. The, yeah, the birds we call in the mist nets. And then there was also a white crown trauma in the, one of the cameras. This is an example 
uh, photos and videos of mammals I've observed. These three animals um, only seen once uh, during my two months here. So the slow, the flying lemurs, the lorries, and bending Yeah, it's just chilling in the tree. <laughs> Uh, actually, this was with Juan, the night drive with Juan. And this. This was a greater mouse deer that was foraging and walking towards us. So it was very curious of the light that uh, Ranger Sari was shining. And this could be, be it, it behaved this way because it might not have been exposed to humans yet. Or this individual animal not exposed to humans as much as dogs or cats would have been.
black and yellow god meal with Saiful. Malpoha. And yeah, the Malpoha was taken by Saiful with my camera. Wow. No, so cute. <laughs> and these are also morning observations, just some examples. Uh, the Asian fairy bluebird, Bornean brown barbet, which is endemic, and the dusky broadbill near the weather station. This uh, uh, flower pecker, Malaysian pygmy flower pecker, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a Bornean spider hunter by the lab, and three large green pigeons. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Asian fairy bluebird and large green pigeons, you need binoculars to see because they were extremely far. <coughs> and these are evening observations. So also, you can see the black and yellow broadbill. This was at the EG complex. Uh, juvenile magpie robin, uh, another spider hunter. Uh, thick bill, thick bill flower packer, and another one bill, black one bill. So yeah, in in the topic of birds, Sari and I did uh, set up nest nets for one week, oh, one week plus, stuff. and it has uh, positives and negatives. So. First, it's good for identifying birds that actually get caught in the net and knowing what bird species there are in the area and how frequently they are in this area. Oh, well. <laughs> there are um, also negatives. Uh, it only covers about 10 feet of the forest cover and only how many, like 8-9 feet wide so the chances of birds getting caught in the net is relatively low. So that's why you need to do this over three or four months to get good results. And another thing, which is a big risk with uh, any traps, any traps used, is capture myopathy. So myopathy is a disease in a muscle where if the animal is stressed out, they can die. So if they get caught in the net for too long, they can, yeah, they can basically die, which is quite sad and it's not good for conservation when your reputation. These are examples of what we caught: uh, Asian Paradise Flycatcher, uh, half-throated bulbul, <coughs> scaly crown gabbler. Bit cute. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, this is a good example. This uh, little spider hunter it actually almost died <laughs> because <laughs> we left it for too long. Uh, Rizzy was struggling to get it out of the net. Yeah, and it, yeah, at one point it just gave up flying. <laughs> So the way I was holding it, it was just laying in my hand. Um, I was quite sad. But then it, after a few minutes, it, it woke up and flew away, Thank, thankfully. So these are screenshots from the book, Birds of Borneo, where uh, we regularly refer to to identify, uh, identify and read about the birds. Next is camera traps. Uh, yeah, that's a photo of uh, Uncle and I setting up the camera trap. No, so, <laughs> no, So, yeah, a fellow colleague and I, Jack, Jack and Jen, we, we were we are actually introduced to camera traps quite late into our project. We only had one week to do observations. But uh, the evidence that we got from this course of a week is actually, it proves that there's a lot of animals here like, because in the span of one week, we already got multiple species caught in the camera. And 
Yeah. The Bushnell and Forest Cam cameras are actually very easy to use and set up. So you just follow some settings. Um, these, these are the settings that are given by the E. Then we just follow and input into the camera. And then, so it's just, when you're setting up, it's just the matter of finding a good spot now. So a good spot would be with obvious uh, animal markings or like eaten fruits. So it's a good place to set up and clear. Um, yeah, when, when you look through the cameras, you get a clear view of the animals and they don't immediately run away like during night walks as compared to night walks because during night walks, you see an animal and it just runs away. So it's not as good as the camera traps are. And as for minor issues, it's all mainly just technical problems. Um, the sensors, some of the cameras are either too sensitive or not sensitive at all. So yeah, it's maybe one good thing to switch out the Bushnell cameras because they're quite out, uh, outdated, uh, quite old. And what else? Ah, the batteries. The, <laughs> the batteries. Uh, we had set up four cameras in total and only three worked. The other one, the, the batteries came out of the compartment lab. So the whole week, we didn't get anything, unfortunately. Yes, no. so, yeah, very sad. <laughs> very disappointing. <laughs> um, yeah, so the batteries is, the is, is one of the biggest issues. Um, when you're installing the camera on the tree, there's a lot of movement. So even then, you, the batteries can pop out of place and you don't even know. And even if you check, it's it's not very obvious that they've popped out of place. And yeah, this the the big near the big Berlian tree was one that malfunctioned. Okay. So this is the photo setting issue stuff on the camera because since the camera automatically sets sets the setting itself, um, this is what happens. So on upon checking the photos, it was obvious that there was an animal here, but since it was too white or too bright, you, you cannot tell what it is. Even in the video, it's the same thing. And then here is a Bornean, Bornean crested fireback, which is endemic to Borneo, which uh, not really obvious. Like, even after some editing, uh, trying to adjust the saturation, we still cannot see anything. But you can actually tell that it's a Bornean crested fireback. Uh, it would have been a good colored photo lah, of the fireback, but. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was just bored checking the photos. But. Okay, so carrying on. These are some observations from the one week setup of our cameras. Uh, I also mark, uh, put the locations of where these animals are. <coughs> Uh, at first, it was hard to distinguish the moon rat, uh, the moon rat and the long-tailed porcupine. But then, uh, upon further research, I found that moon rats are whiter than long-tailed porcupines. Mm -hmm. And this is more interesting. Fire back, a pigtail macaque, um, a, a man, a Malay seabed, and. Uh, uh, giant squirrel. If I'm, if I'm not wrong, giant squirrel. So yeah, very productive week for the camera traps. And next. Okay, so for mapping, um, I heard that Dr. Wagi loves maps. So that's why I use Google Maps to make these maps. <laughs> um, 
So the reason why I use Google is because everyone has Google and it's easy to use. You can transfer data uh, very fast and you can include descriptions and images. I will show the example of these descriptions later. And some limitations with this is that it's limited to only 10 layers. So the GPX files, you can only put 10 different files. And for the ICSC area, you can see that there's no buildings, no bossing, no liposu yet. So it's not updated for this area. And it needs internet, which is very limited here. So this is Peruing and BBT. Uh, just an overview. Lah. So the green would be plants, the purple stars would be another uh, using another scent. So it's either smell or hearing. So over there we can hear the buffy fish owl sound call. Uh, sometimes there's the moon rat smell, which stinks. Don't like it. But then it tells you that they are there now. And this is the big tree loop trail. Uh, night drive to Tampoy in the camera traps and mist nets and this, yeah, this is the example of the description and um, just further information now on, the, on the observations so users if they get open the link they can click the points and then they can read on these animals that are there and I also provided a link that um, has more information on this animal. And I plan to do that for the camera traps and the mist nets as well, just to include in my report. Okay, so I actually took this photo of the moon uh, two, days, uh, two nights ago. It was extremely bright and we didn't even need torchlight to walk around. So that's one example that where the moon affects the visibility of um, when, you, when you go out to look for animals, these animals can see much better than humans. So if humans can already see very far, what else can animals see? They can probably see like it's daytime. So yeah, the moon really affects uh, how, how many animals you see or even any at all because multiple night walks with Sari, we didn't see anything. It was with Grizzly and Jane also, we didn't see anything. And the weather. Uh, after the rain, you can see and look for food, and they don't really care about human presence. Because it's like after a long day at work, you just want to eat, and you don't care about anything else. It's, it's the same thing. Okay. So, light pollution, back to my hypothesis. Um, light pollution is still a very difficult problem to understand. And, but what we know now is that the, temp the color temperature of these lights are very important. And it's proven that yellow lighting is much better for uh, conservation area stuff. And yeah, the lighting affects animal behavior and habitats because some animals, they prefer yellow light and try to avoid white light. So if we can change all the lights in ICSC to yellow lights, it'll probably be better. And also another thing is uh, timing. Timing is means uh, when Al or Joe turn on the lights. Now, now it's around 6 p.m. where it's still bright and unnecessary for lights to be on. So that's already considered light pollution because light pollution means it's when light is on unnecessarily. And yeah, these are examples here. Lah. As for stargazing, um, it's one thing that I enjoyed here at ICSD. Um, yeah, the lights do affect uh, 
the visibility of stars. So I have to, we have to wait after the gem set is off to do stargazing. And, oh, and the flora. Uh, the trees are actually affected by the lights around ICSE. It, it may affect when the trees are fruiting or flowering because of the bright lights coming from the center. So what, all the trees surrounding the center is gets more light than the trees outside the center. So that, again, the circadian rhythm of the trees like to know when it's fruiting, to know when to do this and that, is affected by the lights. It's blinded by the lights. Uh, yeah, these are other things that I found. Uh, sound pollution, obviously from the generator, which can be heard from BBT. You can hear the generator from BBT. Yeah, and the motorcycles or cars, uh, heavy or light machinery like the chainsaws or um, the excavators, power tools, and Bluetooth speakers. I I'm not saying this to ask everyone to stop doing whatever they're doing, but it's just one thing that's uh, causing pollution here. And another thing, uh, sewage can cause a chemical imbalance in the soils which is a long-term impact and is very hard to recover from if the soil gets contaminated. Uh, barbecue, <laughs> the smoke and the noise. Uh, and yeah, different animals react differently to torch lights or any light for that matter. Uh, so in terms of ecology and biology or all the logies like geology, ethology. <laughs> um, yeah, ICSE is considered very new in this environment. So it might take five or ten years for animals to get used to the presence of us being here. And it is proven by scientists that light pollution can slow down the recovery of threatened species. So. If there's a species listed on IUCN as vulnerable or threatened, their recovery can be slowed down by light pollution. Because, yeah, again, the circadian rhythms, and they don't know when to make babies, they don't know when to go get food, they don't know when to go sleep, and etc. And, yeah, due to the light, they don't know Night, night or day, so nocturnal animals are appearing at later times. So, my conclusions. Uh, upon reading the Strategic Management Plan for ICCA, there are 10 uh, conservation values. Uh, of the two, uh, of the 10, there are two that I think need some reviewing um, because it states that uh, ICCA should be an undisturbed functioning ecosystem. Yes, it's functioning, but I don't think it's undisturbed. I think that this center itself or the roads are already causing a disturbance. Up. But there's not much that can be changed actually. Since new roads are being built and then more tourists will be coming here hopefully after COVID. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's a corridor of life and climate change refuge. Uh, for the climate change refuge part, I think that uh, the surrounding forest is uh, good for this to be a refuge. But then uh, I think the light pollution here is too high at a high level that makes the climate here change also. So I think it also needs some review. And uh, the environmental impact assessment maybe needs to be also updated and light pollution included in that assessment. And moving on, I'm almost done, I promise. I promise almost done. Um, <laughs> so this is from the Australian government, uh, Department of Environment and Energy. 
So it's actually a light pollution guidelines and they have checklists of what you can think of and review when you put lights in a certain place. So this is very detailed and it's available to the public. Uh, yeah, so I, I would highly recommend for ICSE to make an artificial lights management plan where you consider the uh, color temperature of lights. And I think that now ICSE uh, street lights, the one with the big birds on it, is at this level. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not. And the best would be this uh, yellow lights with a specific spot of specific radius of light and timing. Uh, the best would be motion sensor lights, but then, yeah, motion sensor lights, but it's quite expensive. So another example screenshot from the national, Australian National Light Guidelines. Um, following this, what I've done here is basically the second step. Just only one part of it, two months out of a year. If I can do this for two, uh, one or two years, then I would get a better assessment for this, um, the environmental impact assessment. So it says, undertake a desktop study of wildlife and where necessary conduct field service to describe population and behavior. So, and define lighting objectives in terms of wildlife. And another screenshot. This is the management checklist. What Post-development, um, these are some questions they would ask for a uh, light management plan. And then there's links to where you can read more information on it. Last slide, guys. Last slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tourism, you can do a lot with the night time. So, nocturnal wildlife encounters is uh, considered high here, but it, it will grow. I believe that it will grow because animals would get used to uh, ICSE and all the activities like night drives, night walks, and so on. So, uh, what the rangers are extremely aware of at the moment is when the moon is bright, um, they prefer not to go out because there's actually no point in going out when the moon is bright. And after, as for the weather, the rain, the rain is uh, after the rain is the best time to go look for animals. Um, and possible ways to increase wildlife encounters is maybe planting more uh, trees that fruit and uh, animals would, you know, come looking for the fruits. And, and for bird watching, uh, it's a good tourism activity given that, you know, they, are, they have good cameras or binoculars, etc. And a, a ranger who knows birds very well. Like, like. And yeah, the last recommendation is to continue to monitor wildlife behavior to better conservation management.